uh, that we can use to Okay, we want to talk a bit about the tools uh, that we can use to enable that next generation microbiome management in aquaculture and also highlight some of the applications uh, that we've been able to do in real commercial uh, farms uh, worldwide uh, and where we use these new microbiome management uh, strategies. Uh, as Lenny said, the talk will be divided between two speakers, myself and also Yasmin, who is almost uh, getting her PhD, uh, so she did her internal defense last week, and she will defend in January, so she will also get her PhD quite soon. Um, as Lenny also said, I'm involved in, uh, in the company Kaitos, uh, for which I'm CEO, where we're trying to bring these microbiome management technologies to uh, the industry. So, of course, we're not located in Indonesia, as you uh, might have guessed. We're located in Ghent in Belgium, so quite far away from Indonesia, around 11,000 kilometers. And we're quite a broad group of people, which you see here on the right-hand side. Uh, so the people with the circle around their faces, that's, uh, that's me, that's Yasmin. And then on the right-hand side, you also see uh, Frederick Martin, who is also a co-founder uh, of the company. And we all come from this bunch of people from CMET, which is a research group at Ghent University, uh, where we have our origins, I would say, uh, dating back, I think, five to six years when we first started working on these projects um, for the first time. So just to give you some perspective, we're quite far away, but I'm happy that we're all here together to talk about this exciting topic. Our background, of course, is not in aquaculture. Uh, initially, as many of you are now studying aquaculture, our background is mainly in studying the microbial ecology of aquatic systems in its most general sense. Uh, so, for example, here you see a research cruise on the Great Lakes of Michigan, where we look at the different microbial communities in this lake uh, and how it changes over time and across the seasons. Uh, we, of course, have to do sampling of those aquatic systems uh, at night, very scenic pictures, uh, but it's also much more complicated when we try to uh, examine the microbiome. So we need to do very uh, laborious uh, processes of filtering samples to collect samples to then bring to the laboratory and then study what those microbiomes are doing in the environment. Um, of course, this is in, an, in a freshwater, in a lakes and river system setup. Uh, much more recently with Kairos, with the company, we're now delving very deep into aquaculture, which you see here, we're looking at shrimp, we're looking at sea bass, sea bream, uh, salmon, and so on, where we try to study the microbiome in those aquatic environments and when we're trying to produce uh, animals or rearing animals in those systems. And on this map, you can see some of the locations where we've done these type of projects uh, in the past year, uh, I would say. So we're in America, we're in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Vietnam, uh, but also very strongly uh, doing projects in Europe where we try to study these microbiomes to help uh, prevent certain problems in those systems. And I'll come back to that in a second, what we're trying to achieve. However, the, the microbiome is very, um, it's a very abstract definition. So when people talk about microbiome, it's very important that we define what we're talking about. So if you take, for example, a shrimp situation where you see many different shrimp ponds on this picture, uh, when we talk about the microbiome, in, we're talking about every micro, microscopic life uh, form that's present in that system. And these can be viruses, which you know many diseases uh, can be caused by viruses. These can be bacteria that are in the system, which are a bit bigger, different life form. We can have higher organisms, such as parasites, but also protozoa that occupy the system. And we also have algae, which can be microalgae or macroalgae that make up the phytoplankton uh, part of this system. And all of those uh, groups of organisms together form what we call the microbiome, which has a functional potential to do uh, metabolic activities in those systems. So I want to show this very early on in the beginning because it's very important that you realize that it's a very uh, diverse uh, microscopic uh, system that we're trying to capture and also manage uh, in these aquaculture systems. And to give you some perspective on how complex this system uh, can be, uh, if you take a simple, simple glass of water uh, from the tap that you take to drink, uh, there's around 10 million cells in such a single glass of water, and those represent thousands and sometimes even 10,000 populations uh, of bacterial species alone. So only one of these groups can be up to 1,000 uh, populations or bacterial species uh, that are in such a glass of water. Uh, if we take a closer look, so if we zoom in to this water, you can see that they range in size going from very small, 0 0.2, all the way up to eight microns in size for a single bacterium. 
If we zoom in even more inside that individual cell, you can see that it has a genome, so it contains its um, molecular information, uh, which ranges also in size between two and seven uh, megabytes, I would say, or megabase pairs uh, of information that a single cell contains. Uh, so also a lot of variation at that level of uh, on the biological scale. And all of these different forms of diversity, if you take them into uh, consideration, you can actually say that there's a very incredible both genotypic, so at the genomic level, and phenotypic at the physiological level, uh, diversity in, in such a sing simple uh, glass of water. And this becomes very evident when you take, for example, a microscopy uh, image of such a system and you see different types of organisms just with the blatant eye uh, that occupy uh, the system. And this is very important to realize that this is a very complex uh, thing to understand and then also subsequently to manage this in, um, in practice. And from this complexity, of course, we need to learn things uh, to understand it and then move towards management with technologies. And to give you a final, um, I would say, to drive home that point of complexity and the importance of those microbiomes in those systems, I just want to give you a simple uh, calculation example. If you would take a single pond, uh, a typical pond in Indonesia is around a quarter of a hectare, uh, let's say it has a stocking density of 150 uh, post larvae per square meter. Um, this is one system, one pond on a farm. If you take a look at all of those different life forms, we easily amount to 3.2 times 10 to the power 16 cells in a single pond. And this is the equivalent, uh, it's a rough equivalent of let's say 3 million planets of a human population uh, that's present in such a system. Uh, at the microscopic level that's doing all kinds of stuff, interacting with each other, uh, causing diseases, but also strengthening the animal health. Uh, it's doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, and it's as such a very complex, but very important life form in the system. And it, this becomes more evident when you compare it to the other life forms in those systems. For example, the shrimp in a single pond like that, you'll have maybe 375,000 uh, shrimp per pond if none of them die uh, during the cultivation. So this contrast is quite uh, remarkable. So if you compare this amount of shrimp to these amount of microbial cells that are there. Uh, but if you look now in the research that, that's been done over the past, I would say 20 years, we've made huge progress on understanding the animals, uh, improving the health of the animals, the production of the animals, intensifying the industry. Uh, but I would say far less progress have been, has been made uh, in understanding, first of all, and then in a second phase, also managing uh, the microbial component uh, of those systems. And that's where we now, both as a company and in our, um, in our background from the university, have been studying these microbial communities in those systems to hopefully better manage them uh, through the use of technology. I think maybe some of you might be saying, okay, this rearing water system, this might be interesting, but that when there are diseases in our systems, they affect the animals and we don't really care about the water uh, in the system. We care about the microbiome uh, that's in the animal, for example. Well, that's a very fair point uh, to make, uh, but aquaculture is quite in a unique situation is in that it has some very interesting um, uh, aspects related to disease that make it so that the rearing water is extremely important to understand and manage. For example, both in healthy and diseased, aquaculture systems, we find these opportunistic pathogens. So we find Vibrio uh, both in very high abundance in healthy systems and in slightly higher uh, abundance in disease systems. So just detecting or seeing that a pathogen is present in a system is not sufficient to say there's going to be a disease or there's a disease uh, present in the animals. However, uh, the second point is that there's a very intimate contact between the rearing water and the animal microbiota itself. And this makes aquaculture quite unique. If you look, for example, at a cow, there's a barrier for microbiota to enter um, the cow because there's a phase where uh, poop goes or feces goes onto the soil, uh, grass grows, the grass gets eaten by the cow, and then you get some extra feed microbiota uh, entering the animal. However, with, um, with aquaculture species, you have a direct contact continuously between the rearing water and the animal. So there's a continuous exchange of uh, microbiota between the animal and the rearing water. And this makes it so that in many studies, we've now seen that actually over time, uh, the difference between the rearing water microbiome 
and the microbiome in the animal or in the larvae, in this case, becomes much smaller over time. So they become very similar to each other the longer we cultivate them in these aquaculture systems. So this makes it so that if you understand the rearing water microbiome and you can steer it and manage it in the right direction, you are able to also control uh, the microbiome that's present in your animals and also control or mitigate uh, disease or adverse effect caused by this uh, dysbiosis uh, of the microbiome. And this brings me a bit with this introduction to the component of managing these microbial communities in aquaculture systems. Uh, it's a very simplified view, but I think it's, it's an important, uh, I would say, anchor point in the presentation to, to understand how we approach this, is if we take a look today at how we manage uh, microbiome systems uh, in, in aquaculture, it's very much an um, observational uh, approach. So for example, if we are cultivating shrimp, in aquaculture ponds, uh, we might have poor microbiome management, we might have a disease outbreak, we might have algae blooms and crashes that cause uh, animal mortality. And this typically um, takes about a week or a bit longer or a bit shorter, it depends on the situation, until you notably see um, mortality or dead shrimp in the environment. Uh, it takes, of course, a bit longer before you can diagnose and uh, observe the mortality very, very easily, do diagnostic tests to know which disease-causing agent is in the system. So in this first phase, you actually have a phase where you miss timely insights uh, to take action to really prevent this entire situation from occurring. And again, it can be caused by bacteria, by viruses, by parasites, or by algae at the same time. Um, so this is, of course, not an idea ideal situation. But of course, even if you diagnose uh, a problematic or a disease event, you might still want to take action. And if you want to take action, you of course need to use treatments. You can use a combination of sanitizers, biocontrol products, uh, probiotics, prebiotics. There's all kinds of products available. Uh, but most of the time, it's a blind mitigation where we use treatments based on, on, on blind recipes that are attached to the box. And we don't know when is the right treatment to use, how much to use of, or, of a product or a treatment. Um, so it's kind of a blind mitigation in the hope that by the end of this disease event and we can salvage the animals, that we don't have more than 50% mortality uh, and a very slow response time to get towards that stage. So I think high level, very simplified, of course. Uh, this is, I would say, uh, in, in most management strategies in farms, uh, still the, the situation. Um, but for today's talk, this is actually a, a bit of a reference for us, because both Yasmina and me will focus on different aspects throughout the presentation. So for me, I'll focus for, from Kairos, from the company um, and technology provider background, I'll focus really on developing technologies that enable us to really manage microbiomes in its early stages, uh, so we can see when something goes wrong and take action. Uh, so I'll focus on tools and applications in this first phase, while Yasmin, she'll mainly focus on uh, showcasing some new ecological insights that we've been able to achieve um, in the hatchery specifically of uh, Vaname shrimp farming um, to showcase how we can use those ecological insights to really make completely new management strategies that can be adopted by farmers in the future that we can then couple back again uh, to tools and applications for the implementation uh, of those insights. So you'll see this slide coming back a couple of times just to, um, to position uh, where we are in the presentation. So coming back to, to my part of this presentation is uh, from the company, so from Kaidos, what we are aiming to do is we're trying to impact using technology and these tools and applications for aspects of shrimp farming. We're trying to lower disease risk, uh, improve the water quality in the systems um, so that we have stable water quality conditions that are optimal conditions for shrimp farming at all times. Uh, we're aiming to improve the microbiome health. So this can be either by um, uh, giving advice related to probiotic use, prebiotic use, uh, stimulating towards a resilient microbiome that doesn't allow diseases uh, to manifest themselves in the system. And we also are aiming to make production of uh, aquaculture more stable. I'm sure many of you know that on typical shrimp farms, survival can range between uh, 30 or 40% all the way up to 70 or 80%. Uh, by using uh, new technologies, we are hoping to really uh, enable farmers to get more towards more stable production uh, of aquaculture, uh, I would say. So, 
translating uh, these goals and these objectives to uh, where we see ourselves in this uh, in this uh, in these different phases. Uh, you see that we with Kairos we want to make technology that enables us to instead of having shrimp mortality as you see here, that we can actually stimulate both the animal and the microbiota continuously by the use of technology. And I'll go deeper into this in uh, in a second. Of course, this is very easy to, to say that this is our ambition. We also have to take a step back and look at uh, what do we know or, uh, or what are some knowledge gaps that we need to fill to be able to do this? Uh, or why hasn't anyone else done this over the past 10 to 15 years? And a very brief summary here on what, what we see as the main knowledge gap is that despite 20 years of very strong ongoing research in aquaculture, uh, I would still say that we have a very strong lack of understanding of both the diversity of these microbial communities, as well as what they are doing, so the functionality. And this is the case for both algae, bacteria, and viruses, and I would say even parasites. Uh, part of this comes because the taxonomy, so the species identity and the names that we associate with these bacterial taxa, but also viral and algae, is still highly uncertain. Uh, so we often get names when we try to characterize those microbial communities, but it's very difficult uh, to have an accurate understanding of, uh, of that uh, identification. In addition, for most of those bacterial taxa, and I think it's even worse in aquaculture, is that we are very, have an uncertain metabolic annotation. What this means is that we may know the genome, so the DNA of those organisms, uh, we still have no way of knowing what 40%, so almost half of that genome, uh, codes for, so which proteins, which functions that those organisms are doing. So that's a very, I would say, strong lack of understanding uh, of this microbial community uh, in this number alone. We're also not able to link, I would say, still microbial ecology and the risk for disease. Uh, so we can observe many different things in the microbial community. We can see something changes. Uh, we can associate that change with operational things, but we're very uh, far away, I would say, for linking it with disease risk. Uh, animal health and welfare, so stress in animals and, and general welfare relating this to microbial ecology is still a very big uh, black box. And I think what we work on at Kaidos is that we, we see that there's a very a strong lack of practical tools for farmers, but also research institutions to use that they can practically use to steer this microbiome uh, by taking, uh, I would say, a holistic, a holistic approach, which means that we look at algae, bacteria, viruses at the same time when we make those decisions. And of course, not only in the rearing water, but also in the gut microbiota uh, as well, uh, where these are important. And I think a nice example of this, of all these points that I just uh, mentioned, uh, this is a paper uh, from Biotech in Thailand, uh, where they did um, sequencing, so characterization of these microbial groups. And you see every different color uh, is a different group of organisms uh, that they were able to characterize. Uh, and you see just uh, how diverse this microbial community is. And I can guarantee you, nobody will be able to say based on these names that you have here, uh, whether there's a connection with disease risk um, or whether what these groups of organisms are doing uh, functionally in those systems at this moment. So a lot of research still needs to be done, I would say, uh, to get there. However, if you look in, in practice, uh, the major focus in microbiome management uh, is that we are trying to control pathogens. So we're trying to control the growth of pathogens, but also the introduction of pathogens through biosecurity um, uh, programs in the farms and in the hatcheries. Uh, but if you take a step back, you'll quickly see that pathogens are both, I would say, rare and abundant at the same time. So they're rare in the sense that uh, typically you have less than 0.01% of all species or cells in a pond system uh, are potentially or opportunistic pathogens. Um, however, despite their low abundance relative to the other species, uh, they are still very diverse. So you see just here a list of different bacterial species and viral species, also fungi uh, that, that, can, um, that can kill animals in, in aquaculture. So it's very diverse, I would say, the number of pathogens that we have. Uh, but they're still quite rare when you compare them to all the other thousands of species that are present in the system. With this, of course, with this focus on pathogens comes uh, the, the, I would say, the conclusion that the majority of people in the industry focus on the abundance and the virulence of pathogens and not of those other thousands of uh, species that you see uh, here. We tend to focus only on the ones that we have known, uh, that we know that cause disease. 
So we have monitoring and detection programs that enable us to do this. Uh, however, uh, the relation uh, between those uh, observations here and general microbial ecology and then also disease, I would say is still strongly missing um, in, in, in research today uh, so far. So we have heard even that sometimes vibrios are opportunistic pathogens, sometimes they are probiotics or have a beneficial effect in the microbial community. There's a lot of missing links there that we still need to uncover to make that connection. And that's also why I'm stressing this holistic approach by looking at all these different groups of my, uh, in the microbial community, um, because these also have a very important part to play in making sure that an opportunistic pathogen uh, does not become a disease causing agent. However, you do need to measure the microbial community, otherwise you cannot uh, study or learn learn anything from the microbial community. Uh, that's so because you are blind, uh, you cannot see it by the naked eye, I would say. Uh, and I've listed here three technologies that, that are used today uh, by both farms, uh, diagnostic providers, and research institutions. I think most of you know agar plating, which is a traditional um, microbiological technique. Uh, you have molecular diagnostics, which typically use qPCR or a variant thereof. Uh, and then we also have next generation sequencing uh, that is used. Um, if you look at the availability of these technologies to the farm, uh, I think most farms do somewhat of agar plating and microscopy, so it's very accessible. Uh, diagnostics is becoming more uh, accessible, but still not quite that widespread, I would say. And then next generation sequencing is, is not accessible to uh, farms today, so to the, to the industry today. Um, but it is available to the research institutions, and they make heavily use, heavy use of this technology to understand what's happening. Um, what I do want to do is I want, just want to list a bit on the positioning of these technologies towards the industry uh, so that we can maybe have a discussion at the end on how, how this is perceived in Indonesia uh, and how these are used uh, there. Because what we see, uh, for example, for agar plating and TCBS, is there are some very strong um, negative uh, aspects connected to the technology uh, because we're only looking at the cultivable fractions, so the cells that are able to grow into colonies on these plates. And there's still a big question mark on uh, whether all those colonies, whether they're green or yellow, uh, are vibrio or not, and whether that means anything, so whether there's any correlation with the disease uh, risk in the system. Uh, in addition, there's also a big question mark to be set today, I would say, whether this technology, if you implement it, if you use it, whether it will lead to any innovations in farming, whether we will have uh, new farming practices or whether that information will help us improve uh, operating procedures. Uh, I would say the answer is no, um, but it's still the most used technology today. It's also semi-quantitative, so you don't really know uh, exactly the abundance of uh, this organism in the system because you're only looking at the cells that can grow on this agar plate. If you move then a bit, I would say a step up towards molecular diagnostics, uh, this technology is able to assess the total fraction of cells that are in the system, but we're limited by the number of targets that we can use. So the number of species that we can target in a single assay uh, is a strong limitation there. Uh, I would say there's still not a very big connection with disease risk. As I said before, you can also always have organisms present in the system. Uh, they vary a bit in abundance, but saying when there's a trigger towards the disease risk based on the abundance is quite difficult uh, today. Uh, I would say a question mark in innovations in farming. I think the major innovations have already been made related to biosecurity uh, pro programs being implemented and then validated and enforced uh, using diagnostic platforms. But towards the future, I don't know uh, how much more innovation this approach can bring uh, to the aquaculture industry. Major advantage, of course, is that it is quantitative. So we know how many copies of DNA or approximately cells we have in a milliliter of water or in a gram of feces uh, or gut material from the shrimp. If we then uh, go towards the, I would say the most advanced technology, uh, use, which uses next generation sequencing, uh, here, we do our, uh, here we are able to get a full community composition. So we know uh, the full uh, number of taxonomic groups and the diversity of those taxonomic groups in the system. Uh, again, we, it's difficult to correlate this with disease risk. A lot of research groups worldwide are working on this. We've seen some indications, but I wouldn't say that it's been established yet. Um, question mark, also here, innovations in farming. I think it's quite certain that we will make innovations in farming based on the knowledge that we gain from this technology. 
um, but uh, it's still uh, a very, I would say, active field. So we'll have to see how this evolves uh, over the next years. Uh, lastly, it is semi-quantitative. So this is, I would say, a big negative is that we only get the relative uh, abundance of those organisms in the system, uh, which doesn't tell us anything, whether they are growing, whether they are dying off. Uh, so it's just a relative amount, a percentage, I would say, um, of each taxonomic group that we have. But these are the tools I think that are today uh, available to study microbiology in aquaculture, uh, except one, and that's the one that we focus on with Kairos. Uh, and that's the technology that is, I would say, abstractly represented on the left-hand side, uh, which we call fingerprinting of microbial communities. So we are specialists in single cell analysis of microbial communities. And what this means is, the word says it itself, we analyze individual microbial cells as they be, are being focused one by one through a high powered laser beam. And by using special cocktails of, uh, of stains, we can actually label those individual microbial cells so they become fluorescent. And the interaction of this fluorescent cell, uh, well, of the cell with um, a laser beam makes it fluorescent and we can extract uh, physiological information from this individual cell. And we can do this very quickly. So we can do this at rates of thousands of cells per second. Uh, and we can look both at algae, bacteria, and large viruses, and even higher organisms uh, in one single analysis, because all of these cells are just focused one by one, one by one very quickly uh, through this machine. Uh, and we get a lot of data as a result. And this is what we call a fingerprint, this data of a microbial community. And you see, it's very abstract, but just to give you an idea, this is some of the raw data that we collect from a microbial community. And you see that it's constantly changing over time. Uh, so you see this aquaculture microbial community is changing continuously over time. And it's a very complex picture that you get uh, from those individual cells. Of course, nobody can uh, understand this by just looking at it. So you need technologies that enable you to extract important information or clues on what this microbiome is doing. And this is where we've specialized in using machine learning technologies to extract what we call health information uh, from these data. And what this, this, techno, um, this approach allows us to do is we can immediately in one analysis look at metrics like diversity, uh, quantitatively look at how many cells we have of these different groups of microbes. We can do species identification of, uh, of different microalgae species in this analysis. Um, we can look at the performance of the microbiome, which I will show you later on, is connected to the survival of, um, of shrimp in the system. And these are just a couple. So I've listed uh, with different icons here, other indicators that we have. And we call these functional indicators that farmers can use uh, to get to know what's going on in their system and take action when they, when they need to. And this is, of course, the reason why, why we do all of this is we want to be able uh, to early detect microbial threats, but also identify opportunities. And by opportunities, I mean that you don't need to take action when something go is going wrong alone. You can also take action when something's going right. Uh, to reinforce and strengthen the microbiome. So we have the best animals, the, the biggest produce, uh, and the lowest risk for disease or any other um, uh, dysbiosis in the microbiome uh, to occur. And as I mentioned, what we, do, we, what we do is we create functional metrics to improve farming. And this may be a bit too uh, descriptive for this presentation, but if you look here, these are just a couple of those indicators that we've developed over the past year. Uh, some of them I'll just quickly highlight. So diversity is very simple, how diverse the microbiome is. But if you look at farming practices, then we are looking at, for example, an aggregation index, which can be used to steer bioflock systems into the right direction. So we know when we're, we're having the right bioflock uh, system. We have a marker organism index that is a risk assessment tool for Vibrio in the hatchery. Uh, we are able to type microbiomes and associate these to both high and low performing systems. I'll give some examples later on. Uh, we're able to assess the productivity of the microbiome, so to detect overfeeding in the ponds, uh, because if you overfeed, your microbiome becomes very active, and we can really easily detect this using this microbial fingerprinting approach, this overfeeding event, uh, so we can actually indicate when you should stop feeding. Uh, and then lastly, this is very important for farmers, we have uh, a performance index, 
And this performance index is actually very strongly associated with the survival of the animal. So the, the, at the end of the grow out phase, so based on microbiome information, we can actually make an assessment on how much the survival will be uh, of the shrimp at the end of the grow out, which is, a, I would say, a really powerful tool uh, moving towards the future uh, that we can offer to farmers. Uh, this, of course, is very, uh, very graphically represented here. We, of course, need to bring this to farmers in a very easy to understand uh, way, very simple reports uh, that they know when to take action and how to take action. And we're working on this uh, as we speak, um, on launching this uh, in the near future. However, something that I did uh, forget, but I think is very important to the students here, is that microbiome preservation is very crucial. Um, so when you take a sample from a pond, and you take it to a laboratory or you store it in the fridge, it does not stay the same. So it changes quite rapidly over time. And so if you want to make a good assessment on what's happening in a pond, you need to make sure that when you analyze the sample, it has not changed uh, since, you take it, since you took it. And to give you uh, an example here, if you take a sample, for example, you can see, okay, in one day, you don't have too much growth when you put it in the fridge. Uh, but after four days, you have almost a tenfold to a hundredfold increase in microbial cells uh, due to growth. So if you would have to wait four days to analyze the sample, this measurement doesn't say anything anymore about the microbes in your system. And it becomes even worse when you wait uh, for one month, of course. So to be able to take these samples and then analyze them using our platform uh, from these systems, uh, which can be very remote and very far away from each other, uh, we developed uh, our uh, vial preservation system, which is here on the right-hand side. It's very a simple vial, which contains a solution that preserves and fixes the microbiome when you sample it. And this enables us to get long-term storage uh, of this microbiome without this growth and without the change in the community composition. So we will not lose species um, due to this storage uh, effect of these samples. And I think this is important from a practical perspective. Uh, when you as aquaculture experts after your education go to the field, that you take this in mind when you are, are trying to assess what's happening in the microbiome. So I've listed somewhat of the, the conceptual things about the technologies that we can use to study the microbiome and how we see this moving forward. Uh, but of course, we need to be able to use this technology to manage. And what we see as the way forward is that we're able, using our technology platform, uh, are able to easily sample pond water, but also gut samples, sediment samples, and so on. Run our fingerprinting analysis on these samples, which we can then use to give a precise recommendation coupled to either a product, but these can also be farming instructions such as aeration, feeding, and so on, uh, to really stimulate the microbiome in the rearing water or in the guts and the sediments, uh, so we get the best outcomes for the farmers. And the way we see this, that we can achieve this, is by doing these four steps. And this first step is, I would say, the, the beginning. So where we do routine screening of these microbial fingerprints. So we understand the dynamics uh, of these microbiomes uh, that, so that we can act on when something changes very quickly. Uh, so I've listed here an example where we quantify uh, the trophic status of ponds, which is the balance between bacteria or phytoplankton and bacteria uh, that we need to take into account. Uh, we want to adopt a holistic approach to microbiome management, management. So we do not only look at Vibrio, either on plate or using diagnostics. We look at all the cells in the system, which can be algae, bacteria, and large viruses, and use that information to manage the system. We need to be able to couple these fingerprints to farming practices. So for example, to the use of products, as I said, but also perhaps to optimize stocking density uh, in these systems so that we can say, okay, this microbiome uh, has the best chance of success when you have a stocking density of uh, 100 or 125 uh, PLs per square meters. And all of these above points, uh, they stand or fall with whether they are based on sound ecological theory, I would say. Uh, and this is what Yasmin will focus on later on. So she'll talk about uh, RNK selection and the importance of this. Uh, maybe she'll uh, talk also about a bit about water maturation and how we can assess this from a scientific and technology perspective. Uh, but this is really crucial for us to be able to make the impact that, uh, that we want. So of course, we wanna be, be able to make a difference. 
And the way that we see that we can make this difference is that we can actually use these functional metrics uh, to detect these events in pounds. For example, as I mentioned, high bacterial productivity, overfeeding detected, uh, heterotrophic farming regime here detected, so no actions needed, high vibrio risk, emergency sanitation should be taken at this pound, low microbiome survival, uh, microbiome performance detected in this pound, so we have an estimated predicted survival of 50%. And we can do this for all of these pounds uh, at the same time so that we can get the right advice uh, to let the farmer take the right action at the right time. And what I'll quickly wanna do is I I I'd like to go to through some applications where we've uh, used our technology uh, to help farms and hatcheries steer their microbiome management in the right direction. Uh, and the first example is for steering farming practices is that we quantify by heterotroph and autotrophic balances, uh, so the trophic state of the, of the microbial community, uh, so that we can steer to a green water or uh, a biofox system very easily. Um, the second example is identifying the right moment when we should use a product or when we should dose a product. And lastly, uh, predicting pond, uh, pond performance, where we've been able to predict survival at the harvest uh, based on microbiome information that we were collecting uh, at our platform. Uh, and let's start with the beginning. How can we help farmers steer the microbiome in their ponds? Uh, well, all of you know bioflock systems, all of you know green water systems, different farming practices uh, depend on the farmer's preferences, uh, but they need to be uh, well evaluated and well steered. So if you want to go to bioflock, we need to steer the microbiome to bioflock, otherwise to green water, and we need to do this based on information. And so what we did is we developed a, a trophic indicator that tells you how close you are to a green water system and how close you are to a fully heterotrophic bioflock system. And we've been able to test this now at several farms and you see some of these results here. So you see all the different ponds uh, at the bottom. Uh, so six ponds at this farm. And you see that these individual ponds are very close to a mixotrophic heterotrophic uh, system and they're very consistent across the farm. So this farm is actually doing quite a good job at managing their microbiome towards a heterotrophic farming regime, but this is not always the case. If you go to another farm, we see that ponds can deviate quite strongly. So we have two green water ponds and all of the other ones are stable, but more in the mixotrophic region uh, than the uh, heterotrophic region. The same is true for the last farm. That is even, I would say, also two ponds very close to the green water zone and all the other ones in the gray mixotrophic uh, zone as well. So we can classify, uh, pounds into whether they are in different farming regimes, but how can we then use this to help a farmer? Well, if we take routine samples of this microbiome throughout the grow out phase, you see from day zero to day 120, so four months of cultivation, you see that the microbiome shifts quite a lot between a green water and a fully heterotrophic system throughout the cultivation. And most of this change happens in the first 60 days. So if a farmer sees this change in the, in the trophic indicator, they can actually take action using sugars or other uh, techniques to help get it back to a heterotrophic farming regime uh, as fast as possible. So it's a very functional, very easy metric for a farmer to use. Uh, however, the, the difficulty is that every pond is quite specific or quite unique. So there's pond specific dynamics in this trophic state. And if you take this example of four ponds, listed here, you actually see uh, that every pond has a unique profile and unique characteristic over time uh, when evaluating this trophic indicator. But the first 60 days seem to be crucial uh, for the phytoplankton um, to establish itself or to stabilize. So we do see that stability sets in after 60 to 70 days of cultivation, but especially in the first 60 days, we should be very cautious and very alert on, uh, in terms of management of these systems. The next step is, of course, that we're going to combine this indicator with our aggregation indicator, where we can couple this information with bioflock formation rates, so we can actually assess uh, the level of bioflock formation in the system. So this is something in progress, but um, for a future presentation, perhaps. Of course, when you have this, um, this shift in trophic indicator, it's related to uh, shifts in algae and you can have both beneficial algae and harmful algae. So as I mentioned in, in our technology slide, we are able to identify uh, microalgae very easily 
uh, in this, these systems, we can identify beneficial algae, but also the algae that we want to avoid. And these are, for example, the cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, as they are called. And we can see that in, in this pond, for example, we can have a very quick bloom of cyanobacteria. But if we do take an action at the right time, which is, uh, was used using a sanitizer at this dotted line, we see a quick decrease again in the blue-green algae, and we've been able to mitigate uh, that we uh, have mortality because of this uh, transition. Um, and we do not lose our beneficial algae in the process. So we can see this. So this is a beautiful example of seeing when something goes wrong in the algae specifically, taking action, and then still retaining our beneficial populations in the system. So this enables us to help farmers create the right, I would say, microalgae balance in the system. Another um, connection to this is that algae blooms and crashes are actually quite normal processes in open pond systems. We've had very much, uh, very frequent discussions with farmers where they say that this is not the case, that they have stable uh, algae or phytoplankton populations. Well, when we look at the data for two different ponds and two different farms, you see that both blooms of both beneficial and harmful algae are quite frequent and normal processes in open pond systems. Uh, however, it's the balance between these two, the harmful and the beneficial algae that needs to be controlled. So if you do take corrective actions, as one I said before, using a sanitizer, we can assist in the control of blue-green algae uh, while allowing these natural dynamics uh, to still take place in the ponds. The second example is that we want to be able to help farmers know what's best for their ponds, so how they can uh, use products in the right way. And I've listed, for example, just from a thesis student from a, two, a year and a half ago, some of the products that exist. These are all probiotics, prebiotics, and so on. Um, we need to be able to help farmers know when they should use a product and when's the right time to use a product and how much to use a product uh, in, in their specific use case. And today, most of those recommendations are based on recipes and expert consultants that translate those recipes into actions. Uh, we believe that using our technology, we can help even a bit more in enabling both the consultants and the farmers to get the most out of their product. And a simple example is uh, shown here. Uh, so here we focus on another functional indicator, uh, the bacterial diversity. Uh, as you may know, high diversity is usually a good situation for a pond. A low diversity means that we have chances that opportunistic pathogens are taking over and we should take action. And what I want you to focus on is the orange line, which is an unhealthy pond that we detected in this farm. And you see that there's an event in which it goes really low in diversity. But this was caused by a number of events, which I won't go into detail about, uh, but there was a cascade of indications where we should have taken action. The first was that right after stocking, which is something that we see a lot, is that we have a very strong decrease in diversity, uh, followed by a stabilization, followed by a very long period of very low diversity for almost up to one month, where we saw decreased diversity and very strong growth in the bacteria. After one month, this amounted to first uh, observation of mass mortality, uh, which was of course uh, not desired, uh, after which uh, a corrective action was taken to help salvage the pond, which you see in the green zone uh, depicted here. So you see, okay, we have a very low diversity, in the pond, but when we do take a corrective action, uh, even though it's too late, we do get this recovery of the bacterial diversity back towards a healthy state. So this is a nice example again, where we take corrective action, we see it in the technology. Uh, unfortunately, we should have taken it way earlier. And this is something that we are working on, trying to combine products and mode of actions of products to help have algorithms that can actually help make this decision much earlier. Uh, when this uh, dysbiosis is detected, so we can have this recovery of the microbiome uh, much quicker uh, in the pond and do not have so much um, animal mortality in the system. Uh, the last example for ponds that I have is, uh, is well, this is actually not helping hatcheries, this is helping uh, fa uh, farms prepare their ponds carefully, is something that we've seen as well is that microbial communities on a single farm uh, can even at the start of cultivation can be very different. And this is again, another indicator, a functional indicator for cell size, where we see that we have ponds that are very close to each other here. So by two, two ponds here, two ponds here, and they're very different from each other in terms of the size of the microbes that are present. 
And if you have big bacteria or big microbes, this is usually an indicator that we have large cells dominate and we have opportunistic taxa present. Uh, if you have small cells uh, dominate, then we have a, more or less a stable community, which you see uh, over here. But this is at the beginning of the cultivation already. This was caused by the use of different water sources on the farm. So different river systems were used to start the cultivation. Uh, however, it took over two weeks before we saw stabilization in this microbial community. So conclusion, this water was not mature, not stable at the time of stocking and is a huge risk, I would say, uh, for a farm to take at the start of the cultivation. And this is again, something that we can see in another functional indicator that a farmer can then use to know, okay, I need to uh, prepare my ponds uh, much better uh, than I'm doing today. Uh, lastly, uh, for farms is that we wanna be able to help farmers predict or have stable um, uh, outcomes of their aquaculture process. So we wanna be able to help in predict survival or stability of survival. Uh, in their systems. And we've developed a new indicator called the performance indicator that is very strongly correlated with the survival of the, the shrimp. And it's still, we're still testing this very heavily, but the way it works is very simple. So we measure the microbiome for the first two months of cultivation. And then this algorithm can predict the shrimp survival after four months. So in the most crucial period of the cultivation, we're able to collect data that tells us something uh, on the outcome after four months. Uh, and this is something that we're heavily working on now today, also for hatchery systems. Um, but this is very promising data that the microbiome is able to tell us something uh, about the survival and the yields uh, for farmers themselves. Uh, I won't go into detail on this uh, for the sake of time, but we're testing this, as I said now, uh, coupled to treatments. So whether treatments can actually improve our performance index. Uh, and we see that this treatment impact on performance is very dependent on different water sources and on different products that we use. Uh, so I won't go into detail, but we've seen that uh, products for different water systems have a very beneficial effect. For other water systems, <clears throat> they have a negative effect on the performance. And for even other water systems, they have no effect uh, on the microbiome performance. So yeah, yeah, the arrows depict <clears throat> that we have uh, different actions or different uh, effects of the treatment. And to close, uh, I hope I, I'm not taking too much time, Lenny. I wanna show something about hatcheries as well, <clears throat> because this is where the farming process starts. And for hatcheries, I just wanna give two brief examples. Uh, the first example is the importance there as well of water preparation, uh, where we can really easily detect tank deviation already at the stocking of the tanks. And second, where we can actually identify uh, high-performing systems. So high-performing hatchery systems in the 20 days until PL10 uh, based on survival assessments as well using our technology. So we also, as I said, we wanna help farmers. We also wanna help uh, hatcheries. And with hatcheries, we wanna be able to help them prepare their tanks carefully and in the right way. And what you see here is uh, two measurements taken at time point zero at stocking and then time point one um, 21 hours after stocking. And what you see is that a single tank was slightly deviating at the beginning of stocking, uh, but was after 21 hours, had almost a tenfold increase uh, compared to the, the other tanks. So we should have taken corrective action for this deviating tank right there and then, uh, but we did not because we were observing uh, the dynamics of the microbiome. And after 10 days, this tank uh, had 100% mortality. So we saw that this actually this deviation at the beginning was actually an early warning uh, that we needed to take corrective action or we would lose uh, this individual tank. Uh, so these first one to two days, not only in farms, but also in hatcheries are very crucial uh, to monitor correctly and take action very early on. Uh, secondly, uh, we have an, another algorithm that can actually tell us whether uh, we are in a high performing or low performing hatchery system in terms of survival. Uh, what you see here on the left hand side uh, is our typing algorithm. So it tells us which type of microbiome we have, a type one, a type two, type three, or type four, and how this changes over time during the hatchery process. And you see that it changes over uh, these uh, five to 20 days uh, of cultivation, of rearing uh, those post larvae and larvae. And you see that in these two systems, we go from a type one to a type two, and sometimes to a type four. 
Uh, for the uh, low performing systems, we quite quickly go towards a type three microbiome and we stay at a type three microbiome fingerprint. And this for us has been an indication uh, in these hatchery systems that we will have low performance. And when you look at survival, we see that tanks which have a microbiome type three actually have a 20% lower survival than our high performing systems that do not have this, uh, this characteristic. Uh, so just to give you an idea, so just to show you that all of these different functional indicators tell us something different about our, our aquaculture systems, and they can help us in different scenarios, make us uh, see what the right um, effect is or the right treatment is, and what the right decision is to take this corrective action, uh, going from an early warning uh, to a corrective action to a performance increase that we see. And my final slide is, uh, actually is, is, I think, a question for the industry is that how will farmers be able to benefit from all the things that I've been talking now uh, today? Uh, well, I'm glad to say that we're making a lot of progress now on building a full technology platform that brings this to farmers, uh, which goes through a very easy, simple reporting via email and smartphone notification. So two minute glimpse of these insights that they need um, to take these corrective actions. Uh, towards full health reports that are connected to those simple reports where they see all the functional indicators to take the right decision for their farms, uh, towards product, product specific advice, uh, where we work very closely to product providers and developers uh, to connect our technology to the use of those products. And finally, I think for research institutions and R&D centered companies, uh, we are building also personal farm data centers where all the data is collected for research and development purposes as well. So. I think all of those products and services in the future will enable uh, farmers, but all the aquaculture stakeholders to really make use of uh, what we're doing uh, so far. So with this, I think it's up to Yasmin now to take over while she'll really go into the science and the research side of things uh, while I focus on the application side. Unless Lenny, you wanna have a break or Q&A uh, right now. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruben, for uh, your very engaging presentation and for sharing us, uh, sharing with us uh, the impressive technology of uh, Kaitos. Um, yes, uh, we can have five to maximum 10 minutes of short um, Q&A session. Uh, I will, at the moment, I don't have questions. I don't see any questions in the chat box. So uh, any participants, if you want to address your question directly to Ruben, you can uh, raise your hand. There's a raise hand um, tools here in the Zoom somewhere you can look at. Um, yeah, please. Any question at the moment before we continue? Yeah, uh, we have one question here from Dautan Hawk. Um, you can activate your microphone and also um, ask your question, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yeah. I can hear you then. Yeah, thank you, Ruben, for your uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I have uh, some questions for you. Uh, the first thing is, uh, my question is, what is the highest data level uh, that Ketos can reach? That's a very good question. It's very dependent on, I would, it's, it's I think, I, we cannot say it's genus level or species level. It's really taxonomic uh, dependent. Uh, so for some, we're going to the genus level, for other, it's mainly family level that we can do this identification. Uh, this is also specialization uh, of Yasmin. Uh, so maybe Yasmin, you can also comment on the taxonomic resolution of the prediction uh, that you've done now in hatchery. Uh, is there a line to be drawn on whether it's genus or whether it's family or whether you, we can go deeper? Yeah. Um, uh, I, do you want me to answer now? Maybe. Yeah. 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 Uh, so indeed, we uh, made some models that can predict the taxonomy of the bacteria that are present in our system based on uh, the KITOS technology. But uh, as of yet, it's very dependent, as Ruben said, on which uh, bacterial group you are interested in, whether or not we can uh, predict that with high resolution. So um, for some strains, it might be possible to go, well, for some taxa, it might be possible to go to strain resolution in the future. But for other taxa, it uh, may remain difficult. Uh, but this is still something that's under active development also. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, as I understand is when you said about different way to find the diversity of the microbiome animal in the pond, 
uh, general, we have uh, like normal taxonomy or new genetic students. So as I, um, according to your presentation, I think maybe you based on the, um, what we call morphology of the, um, well, we can say the color or the shaft uh, after we use the fluorescent that attack to the animal, right? Yep, so it's indeed based on, on physiological or phenotypic properties that we characterize those individual uh, cells and particles that we characterize. So we do not uh, look at the DNA or the sequence of those DNA mm -hmm. uh, molecules in the cells. It's uh, based on the interaction of stains that we use with the microbial cells. And these tell us something about size, morphology, activity, viability of those individ individual cells. And all of that information put together we on average have around 12 parameters and sometimes even more per cell that we characterize. And if you would look at cells in a 12 dimensional space, which nobody can do, uh, that's the type of information that we then use to, to, um, to identify uh, taxonomic groups, uh, but also to look at the diversity of this microbiome, to look at the size of those uh, microbial cells. And that's where we get all those, those indicators from, uh, I would say. You no, know, great. Because I'm taxonomy in the past, so uh, maybe I I can understand a little bit about that. Um, so with that, we need a library um, to make sure the right animal we want to find out. So my question is, um, if we want to apply it in a new environment, um, so how long or, or how long to create um, a new data to have the like ninety percent accuracies of uh, the biodiversity system we want to have. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's an excellent question. Uh, we're evaluating this now, so we have tens of thousands of samples today uh, that we work on and make the algorithms better and improve them on. Uh, but uh, your question is very valid when we go to a new environment, new farming practices, let's say from Indonesia to Ecuador, uh, or even within the same country, different uh, climate conditions, farming conditions. Uh, we need to make sure that our alg algorithms are also performant in those systems. And that's now been, I think, the major focus will be in the next six months to be able to do this. So we're looking in Vietnam and in Indonesia, but also in Thailand and Ecuador uh, to build our database even, even bigger. Uh, so we can really have for every farming system the right functional indicators uh, defined uh, and working as, as they should. Uh, but it's a really good question uh, because in our experience, aquaculture microbial communities have been the most diverse and exciting communities that we've ever seen uh, mm -hmm. with our technology. If we compare this to a lake system and a river system, they're very boring now that I have to look at the data. Aquaculture systems are the most intriguing, interesting microbiomes that I have ever seen. Uh, but that comes at a cost, and the cost is that they're very variable and they change very frequently. But that's also why I love doing this work. So, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your answer. And I have last questions for you. Uh, you said about a sample reservation, and I think that Kitos have um, the your 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 own function to keep the uh, the quality of the samples stable in time, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh, mostly I can understand your technique. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Zhao, for the question. Uh, for now, I would like to now continue with our second and last uh, speaker for today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce again uh, Jasmine. Um, so, Jasmine Heise, I hope you can already see my screen. Yeah? Uh, Yasmin Heise is, is a PhD candidate at the Center of Microbial Ecology and Technology at Kent University, Belgium. She is currently a principal scientist at Kytos, specializing in cytometry, molecular microbiome analysis, and microbial ecology. She is finishing her PhD research, which aims to acquire insights into the microbial community ecology of rearing water bacterial communities and their community members, and to contribute to the development of tools that can be used for investigating and monitoring these water microbiomes. Uh, yes, so please, I, would, uh, I will 
Yeah, I will give the floor to Yasmin if you will continue. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the nice introduction. I will share my screen. So, can you see my screen? Yeah, clearly. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you again for the introduction. And as Ruben already said, um, what I have been doing during my PhD is mainly to focus on the ecology of aquaculture microbiomes with the idea that on the short or on the long term, we can use this ecology to uh, develop management or monitoring strategies that will be more effective than the strategies that we have today at uh, the blind mitigation that Ruben referred to, just using antibiotics and um, doing a uh, non-specific killing of your microbiome, you will try to develop uh, tools that promote your uh, good bacteria and that will um, reduce the abundance of your bad bacteria. So that's a bit the idea behind my research. And for my presentation of the day, I would like to share with you some results uh, that we have obtained through a sampling campaign that Ruben and I have performed on a shrimp farm in Thailand. So uh, in that sampling campaign, we have monitored five replicate tanks of Vaname larvae culture. And uh, we have chosen to work with the larvae culture because these uh, life stages are mostly uh, the most sensitive to high mortality frequencies. And as Ruben indicated before, uh, the rearing water is very important to steer the microbiomes of the host. So that provides an opportunity uh, for us to manage the communities. So we decided to really focus on the ecology of that rearing water. So there has been already quite some research in uh, the last years because there's more and more interest in this rearing water, but there's still a lot of research questions that we need to answer. So we decided on a few that we wanted to answer and of which I want to share the results with you today. Uh, so the first is we wanted to know what is driving the dynamics in the rearing water over time, because if we want to obtain some kind of microbial control, uh, then it would be already very informative for us to know which uh, factors have a high potential for steering the communities towards one or the other state. Uh, secondly, we were interested to know how variable and dynamic peripheral microbiomes are. And what I mean with peripheral microbiomes are microbiomes of, for example, live feeds or dry feeds, or the microbiomes in water that is used during water exchanges. So everything next to the um, cultivation tanks, actually. And then thirdly, and that's related to the second question, we also wanted to know how important these peripheral microbiomes were for the rearing water microbiome. Uh, and that is because uh, if these microbiomes have a very large influence, then of course we want to prioritize also management of those microbiomes. But if they are not important, uh, then we should maybe not invest too much money into also monitoring and management of those microbiomes. And then finally, uh, we wanted to know what the life strategies of bacteria in the rearing water are. Uh, and I will explain later in a minute what I, what I mean by those life strategies and whether we could link that with the health of the cultivated organisms. So I will start uh, maybe to describe a bit better the sampling campaign. So here on the left, you can see a scheme of uh, the sampling campaign and of the tank operations um, over those 18 uh, days of cultivation. So here on the bottom, you can see the five shrimp tanks that we monitored. And here are all the peripheral microbiomes that we were interested in. So that were the algae and artemia as live feeds, uh, five different types of dry feeds and exchange water. So the algae were added in quite low abundances because the only goal was to feed the shrimp actually. And that was from day one until day 10. The dry feeds were added throughout the entire cultivation, but five different products were used at different time points. The artemia were added from day five on until the end of the cultivation. And then from day seven, every other day, there was also a water exchange where about 30 to 50% of the water was being replaced by fresh water, uh, just in order to make sure that the water quality remained good. So we sampled these um, different environments at a resolution of three hours for flow cytometry. And we took one sample uh, every morning for 16S sequencing to identify uh, the bacteria that were present in the communities. And then finally, we also did a selection of samples for shotgun metagenomics, that's for the life strategies, but I will explain that later when I come to that part of the presentation. 
Um, there were two tanks, tank one and tank four, that have crashed during the cultivation. Um, I will not focus today on why they have crashed, but I'm just mentioning it here because you will see that sometimes there is some missing data uh, because the last time points of those tanks were not sampled anymore because they were after the crash. So firstly, the bacterial abundance dynamics in the system. Uh, so here you can see the bacterial density over time in the cultivation for the five replicate tanks. And uh, the starting density in these tanks was about four um, times 10 to the fifth cells per ml. Now, if you're used to working with plating data, this might uh, seem like a lot, but actually this is a typical bacterial density that we find in marine communities. So if we sample, for example, the North Sea in Belgium, this is also the typical uh, density that we will find there. Over the following seven days, we see that the uh, density of the bacterial communities uh, increases with up to two log units per uh, cells per ml. And uh, in the days that follow, we see that there's a bit of differences in the dynamics between the uh, replicate cultivations and the communities actually end with differences of up to one uh, log unit between the replicate tanks. So overall, we see that these densities are increasing up to three log units. So that means at the start of the cultivation and at the end of the cultivation, your larvae are actually being exposed to a thousand times more bacteria uh, from the rearing water. And also very interestingly, we see that there's a high difference between the replicate tanks. And altogether, this data actually indicates just how much you are actually, while you try to feed your shrimp, you're very actively also feeding your microbiome and your bacterial community. Uh, secondly, we also looked into the dynamics of the uh, taxonomy of the bacteria that were present. So what you see here is an ordination plot. Uh, and you can just interpret that as uh, dots that are very close to each other, they are very similar to each other, but dots that are very far from each other, they are very dissimilar communities. And the dots are colored according to which of the replicate tanks they belong to. And the size of the dot is corresponding to time in the cultivation. So these very small dots here, that's the startup, and the larger dots, that's the end of the cultivation. Now, you can already see that there seems to be two strong community shifts. So I will put a, a taxonomic profiles next to it so we can have a look at what is really happening. So what you see here is the relative abundances of uh, the top uh, genera in the communities over time for the different um, replicate tanks. And we see that for day one and day two, the communities in the replicate tanks are mostly the same with the exception of tank four where there seems to be some kind of deviation. Then on day three, we see that there's a very strong community shift and our community composition becomes dominated by totally different bacteria than was compared as the first two days. Over the days that follow, we see that there's more gradual shifts. There's some changes, but overall the dominant community members stay dominant until around day 10, 11, where we see that again, the second community shift is happening. And what happens then is that again, bacteria are dominated by, uh, the tanks are dominated by completely different bacterial communities. And in contrast to the first shift, we now see that each tank seems to have a different microbiome. So it's very interesting that we see that there appears to be something that is causing two very big shifts in the community composition. Uh, but of course, we were very interested to know what would be uh, the cause of these community shifts. So we tried to link it with any of the operational practices at the farm. And we found that we could link this very well to the algal densities in the water. So I plotted here the algal densities in the five replicate tanks over time. And I put here the two black lines. They are the two community shifts. So from day two to day three, and then around day 10, 11, the second shift. And you see that the timing of these two shifts um, corresponds very nicely with when the uh, algae become abundant in the water and when they are reduced again in abundance in the water. And next to just the timing of those two shifts, we also found that we could link uh, 39 taxonomic uh, groups significantly with the algal densities in the water. And these, uh, many of these 39 taxa were actually the taxa that we see that they are abundant in between these two community shifts. So overall, our, our results are indicating that this phytoplankton which is added in a very low quantity, so not at all like uh, what is the case with green water, already seems to be a very important driver for the community uh, in the rearing water.
Uh, and yeah, what you also see on these slides is that uh, on this figure is that the community composition between the replica tanks seems to be very different. So we tried to quantify this. And for this, we used the break Curtis dissimilarity. It's just a similarity metric. And if it's close to zero, that means communities are very similar. Close to one means that communities are very different. And what you see here, each line is for one individual tank. How um, dissimilar this tank is as compared to all the other tanks on average. And you see that very clearly over time, the dissimilarity between tanks seems to be increasing very strongly. So that means how farther you are in the cultivation, how more different your uh, communities and your tanks are. Now, uh, communities can differ from each other because of different reasons. Eh? Um, they can differ from each other because different bacteria are becoming abundant in the community, but while still the same bacteria are present. And that is something that we call an abundance variation. But they can also differ from each other because all of a sudden, a taxon that was not present is now present, or a taxon that was present has disappeared from the community. And this is a process that we normally refer to as turnover. Uh, and if you look at the differences between the tanks, so this is again the average differences between the tanks, we actually see that the abundance variations, so differences in relative abundances of taxa that are present, are explaining almost all the differences between the replica tanks, because turnover here in green is so small that you cannot even see it here. So that means that our replica tanks that are so diverse, they actually all contain more or less the same taxonomic groups, but at very different relative abundances which is an interesting thing to know if you want to manage these communities. Now, that brings me to my second and my uh, third research question. So we were also interested in what I call these peripheral microbiomes. So the shrimp tanks, they are, of course, uh, a bit the heart of your farm. But around that, there's a lot of different microbiomes. And these can be microbiomes of dry feeds, of the different live feed products, of the exchange water, but that can also, for example, include uh, microbiomes of uh, equipment that are used by the farmer. Now, for the sake of our um, research project, we were interested to uh, investigate the microbiomes of compartments that have a direct interaction with the rearing water, so the feed products and the exchange water. And we wanted to know how dynamic or how vari variable are these microbiomes, because most studies to date, either they focus on the host or they focus on the water or on the combination of the two. But it's very rare that these um, additional microbiomes, which may influence the water, are monitored in parallel. So that's what we decided to do. Um, so I will start with, uh, I don't know, I will first give an overview of the uh, community compositions. So this is again an ordination. So dots close to each other are more similar. Dots far away from each other are more dissimilar. And what you see here is that each of the different sources already has a very distinct uh, microbiome. And that's very interesting to see because, for example, the Artemia cultures and the Alga bioreactors, when they are started up, they are actually started up with the same water of the exchange water. So it could have been that those microbiomes were very similar, but that doesn't seem to be the case. There's really a distinct microbiome in every compartment. Now, I will only go to the results of the algae uh, cultures and Artemia, because those are, uh, in my opinion, the most interesting. So for the algae, um, these are the bacterial densities. And uh, so to give you some more information, Every day, one batch of algae was used to feed the larvae. Uh, and that is the background color that you can see here. So green and white are different batches always. And there was always an addition of uh, algae in the morning and one in the evening. So that are the two dots that you see. And we see that um, there can be a one log difference between batches, um, between batches that were created on different days. And also we see that even within the same day, so if you add some um, algae in the morning or you add some algae in the evening, there can be a five-fold difference in the amount of bacteria that you will add to your rearing water community, which is quite a large difference. Then we also check the uh, community composition. Uh, so here you see the relative abundance on the different batches from the algae. Uh, from the algae and what you see immediately is that this is always a different community so there's again a high heterogeneity in the composition between these batches so it's not only the abundance but also the composition of the taxa that are very different 
Uh, but despite having that high heterogeneity, you do see some taxa seem to be appearing most of the time. So we could identify 16 taxa that seem to be uh, always associated with these algal cultures. So we know that we add specific taxonomic groups uh, to the water, but next to those groups that we are aware of, there's always also a microbiome that is not shared between the batches. Uh, then I will move to the Artemia uh, results. So uh, as you mostly know, um, for Artemia to be used as a live feed product, there's normally cultivation of the Artemia, after which they are transferred to a cold storage where they can be used um, or well, where they can be sampled to be used as a live feed. So on the farm um, where we did the sampling campaign, Artemia were always used over a course of 24 hours. So every morning at 11 a.m. there was a new batch of L uh, Artemia prepared that was then used um, until the next day at 8 a.m. So uh, what we actually sampled was every three hours this uh, storage tank where the Artemia were kept. And what you see here then, these are again the bacterial densities over time in the cultivation. And again, different background colors are different batches. And now here I colored the different time points according to how old a batch is. So the white dots are 11 a.m. This is a very fresh batch. Uh, 8 a.m. the next day is colored in dark because this is then a batch that's almost 24 hours old. And what you see here is that very interestingly, despite this cold storage, there's every day uh, a growth observed in these storage tanks. And this causes differences of up to one log density. So similar to what we see with the algae, if you add uh, Artemia to your system today and you do it tomorrow, it's possible that you will add 10 times as much bacteria to the uh, rearing water communities. Then we also check the community composition. Uh, and here you see also similar to what we see with the algae, that there's very high heterogeneity in composition between the individual batches but also that several taxa seem to be appearing almost always. So we identified 27 uh, core taxa that were typically associated with Artemia storage um, community compositions. Now we see that these um, peripheral microbiomes are very heterogeneous. That was for the exchange water and for the dry feeds, we had exactly the same conclusions as for the algae and the Artemia. But of course, uh, if these contributions to the rearing water are not very large, then maybe this is something that we don't want to invest our time in uh, to manage these communities better. But if the contributions would be very large, then of course that's something that uh, would be very important to manage these microbiomes as good as possible. So uh, to investigate this a little bit further, we have developed what we call a search tracking pipeline, uh, where we try to assess uh, for each um, for each peripheral microbiome on every day, how many uh, taxonomic groups may it have introduced to the rearing water. And already uh, you can see these are the bacterial loads of uh, each peripheral microbiome towards a tank per day, so the amount of cells that they add. And we can already see at first sight that different uh, sources have very different contributions in terms of how many bacterial taxa they are adding. So we can expect that the, there will be some differences and also they have a different frequency of addition. So cumulatively, we also expect that there will be differences between the different uh, peripheral microbiomes. Now here I made a very um, theoretical illustration of the pipeline that we have created. So on a specific day, which I now call day I, uh, we want to know on the I plus one, to what extent did the microbiomes of the peripheral, uh, of the peripheral sources on the I contributed to this microbiome. So we check for individual bacteria. I here just made an illustration of three theoretical bacteria. Uh, what their abundance was, their absolute abundance, we can calculate that uh, based on flow cytometry and sequencing together. And if we know how much water there was in the tanks, so we check the absolute abundance on the I and on the I plus one. And we also calculate the absolute abundance in each of our sources. And based on the comparison of these abundances, we can actually estimate whether or not one of the sources was an important contributor for a taxon. Now here are the results of the source tracking. 
Uh, this is a bit of a complicated graph, but I will guide you through it. So you don't need to try to uh, interpret all the details. So what you see on the um, y-axis are different taxa that were introduced to the tanks. What you see on the x-axis are the different sources. And the color in the background is referring to which type of source it is. Uh, and each dot is actually an introduction. And you see that we had in total 48 introductions. Our algae were responsible for 26 introductions. The artemia for 15. The exchange water for six. And our dry feeds actually only for one. Uh, now there are two introductions that I would like to, to highlight a little bit. So I put here these green arrows. These are two OTUs that they were introduced through the algal cultures at the start of the cultivation. And this is a very important introduction because these taxa together, they sometimes make up more than 60% of the community to which the larvae are being exposed. So that means that the contribution of the algae is very important to determine to which um, bacteria the larvae are being exposed. And a second uh, introduction that I would like to highlight are here these purple, uh, these pink arrows. Uh, and they are two OTUs that were classified as members of the Vibrio genus that were added through the addition of the Artemia to the water. Uh, as you all know, the genus of Vibrio contains a lot of opportunistic pathogens. Now, in our uh, case, we could not determine whether these really are opportunistic pathogens because we only have 16S data. But nevertheless, it's very interesting to see that potential opportunistic pathogens can actually be introduced through our, to our system uh, through the Artemia cultures. This was already hypothesized in literature, but there was no uh, really quantitative data about this. So this was definitely a very interesting finding for us. Now, if you look at all these uh, OTUs together, we see that they actually make up 10% of the total number of OTUs that we find in our system. And if we also take into account how abundant they are becoming in the tanks over time, we see that 37% of the bacteria to which larvae are being exposed are actually originating from one of these peripheral sources. So that means that for uh, maintaining healthy systems, maintaining healthy peripheral microbiomes will be very crucial. Now, this is uh, my last research question. So as I said, I was interested in uh, determining the bacterial life strategies of bacteria uh, present in the rearing water. So what is a bacterial life strategy? Uh, bacteria are very diverse and um, if we want to try to understand how they respond to disturbances or to changing conditions, we actually want to have some kind of conceptualization of this diversity that allows us to make easy um, conclusions. So we try to make some kind of classification and we can do this very easily because bacteria are always facing trade-offs just like humans. If you invest your time to improve your skill for one uh, aspect, then there will be something else that you are less good at. Um, so that is actually the idea behind life strategies. You, your bacteria will always have a combination of specific traits uh, and other combinations will normally not occur. So if you know these combinations, you can draw some conclusions on how a bacterium will react in different uh, environmental conditions. So there's uh, a lot of different bacterial life strategy classifications. One is, for example, specialist vs. generalist. A specialist is a bacterium that will use uh, a specific set of uh, resources, but it will be very efficient at using these resources. While, for example, a generalist, it will use a lot of different resources, but it doesn't necessarily have an optimized metabol uh, metabolic pathway for each individual, um, each individual compound. So their efficiency might be very much lower than a specialist. Another uh, frequently used classification is oligotroph versus copiotroph. And an oligotroph is a bacterium that uh, resides well when there's not a lot of resources available, while a copiotroph only um, thrives well if there's a lot of resources available. And then finally, the R versus K strategist is also a classification scheme that is being used a lot. And an R strategist is actually a bacterium that can grow very fast and that will react very opportunistically, as I tried to depict here. If conditions become favorable, there's a very quick growth. But once the resources are being used, for example, conditions change and they are less favorable and then they will stop growing. 
while a case strategist will respond less uh, quickly to changing environments, but um, even when the environment change, they will still keep on growing. So they are typically slow growing uh, organisms that do not uh, behave opportunistically. And this is actually the life strategy classification that I was interested in for our rearing water microbiomes. And I will tell you in a minute why that is. So there's a research group in uh, Norway, the research group of Olaf Fadstein, which uh, is working with R and K selection in uh, rearing water communities. And they actually see that if they work with a system that is being dominated by K uh, strategists, the cultivation performance of their larvae seems to be improving. So I put an example here. Uh, this is FTS means um, flow through system, MMS means uh, microbial maturation. And how you can think of a microbial maturation, it's just uh, water that they sent, for example, through a biofilter or water that they left stand for a few weeks uh, so that all the resources that are available in the, in the water are converted into biomass so that there's actually not a lot of room to grow anymore. And this is what they call microbial maturation system. And that's actually a system that is dominated by a strategists. And here you can see the survival of some cot larvae. And you see that it goes from 70% in this flow through system to almost 30% in a microbial maturation uh, system. So this clearly indicates that having these K, uh, K strategists in your water seems to be beneficial in some way. Uh, but of course, the a survival of 30%, this is still quite low. Uh, and as yeah, engineers, we want to improve this uh, performance more. So what we want to know in our study actually is trying to determine what are the typical properties of R and K strategists, because we define them based on their uh, growth properties. But next to that, we actually don't really know what the functional properties of typical R or typical K strategists are. So that is the research question that we wanted to ask with the idea that on the long run, we would be able to further improve these kind of management strategies. So what we did to interfere these um, life strategies is we used uh, shotgun metagenomics and we obtained 67 high quality metagenomes uh, from the rearing water communities of the sampling campaign that I um, have been introducing before. For each of these 67 uh, metagenomes, we estimated two properties. And the first is the intrinsic growth rate. This uh, can help us to quantify whether a bacterium is fast or slow growing. But this is, as it say, uh, says, an intrinsic property. So this is just under the hypothetical conditions of ideal nutrient availability and no, no competition. How fast can this bacterium grow? What you see here is the estimated growth rates, and these different dots are different uh, max, but I didn't put in names because that's a very big figure. And you see that there's quite a wide range of maximum estimated growth rates over the different max. The second property that we tried to estimate was in-situ growth activity. So based on a uh, a metagenomic sample, if you have a genome, you can estimate whether or not a bacterium is uh, dividing while you saw at the moment that you sampled or not, and whether there's more uh, division or less division. And that parameter we can actually use as a measure to estimate whether there's very opportunistic growth, so sometimes very actively growing and sometimes not growing, or this, more, this is more a constant growth and this growth parameter is always more or less uh, the same. So also here you can see this, um, yeah, in-situ growth activity parameter that we uh, made over the different max and they are ordered from small to low. And similarly to what we see at the in, on the intrinsic growth rate, there's just a gradient of, uh, of this parameter. Now, since for both parameters, there's just a gradient, it's actually not that easy to say based on these two figures, what is an R strategist and what is a K strategist? And I put the definition here again, actually it's a combination of these two uh, properties. So what we did is we devised some kind of um, classification scheme and I will just illustrate it very um, theoretically here, theoretically here, and I will not go into too much detail, but you can always ask about it later if you're interested. So we have opportunistic growth based on that in-situ growth parameter or constant growth, and we divide that um, 
parameter space by a change point detection algorithm that determines when there's really a big statistical, statistically speaking, shift in this uh, variable. And we do the same for the maximal estimated growth rates. So that way we can uh, put two uh, classes in our parameter space. Opportunistic fast growth is typically an R strategist. Slow and more constant growth is typically a K strategist. And everything that we have here in between is something that we actually don't know. So we decided to classify these as some kind of intermediate class. Uh, but that's actually intuitive also uh, something that we would be expecting. There will never be organisms that are completely R strategist or completely K strategist. We expect that this is some kind of gradient. And some taxa will indeed be in the middle and cannot be classified as either of the two. Uh, so we just worked with this third class that we called intermediate. And then these are the results for our own data set. So these are the 67 uh, max from our data set that we classified according to R or K. We had 15 R strategists and 26 um, K strategists. Uh, and then we tried to see, uh, can we now relate this to health? So what you see here is a relative abundance of each of our max on tank three, four, and five, because that's where the samples came from. And instead of coloring, coloring them according to their identity, they are now colored according to whether they're K strategist, an R strategist, or an intermediate. And the first thing that you see is that these R and these K strategists apparently can coexist very well in the water. So it's not the case that the water is constantly selecting for very fast or very slow growth. Both of them seem to be able to balance each other out and live together in that rearing water environment, which is a very interesting finding already. Um, and then, of course, we also wanted to know whether we could relate this to health. So what you see here is a mortality estimate made by, uh, made by the farmer over time in the cultivation. Uh, and so a value of zero means that the, the performance was doing very well. And here, tank four, as I said, crashed. So here the mortality went up. And what you actually see is that you cannot make an immediate relationship between how many R and how many K strategists there are in the water and how good the performance was doing. So this is an, also an interesting finding because that challenges actually a bit the findings of that Norwegian uh, research group, which tried to just make the community dominated by case strategists. Our results indicate that just having a dominance of case strategists is maybe not enough because the abundance itself doesn't relate to performance. So we try to look a little bit further. Uh, and what you can see here on this figure is an ordination on the sample level. So each uh, dot on the plot is a sample. Um, and the samples are colored according to how well uh, the tank was performing. So red colored uh, tanks are performing not so good. Green colored tanks are performing really good. And the left ordination is based on the abundances of the max in the system. So how abundant is each taxon? While the right figure is based on how actively growing is each taxon. What you see here is that red and green, they are just ordinated very closely to each other. And then here, there's also this uh, little bit less good performance which is then kind of ordinated away, but on one axis, it's very closely um, related to the things that are performing well. So it doesn't seem like this abundance, similar to my previous slide, seem to relate very well to the uh, larval performance. While if you look here, if you ordinate based on the growth activity, the ordination is of course not perfect, but you see that these bad tanks and these also reduced performance tanks, they seem to be ordinating very closely to each other with the exception of one sample. So that suggests that despite this uh, relative abundance cannot be related that easily to um, the shrimp performance, there is something in that growth activity that indeed relates to health performance. So as of now, we cannot explain this yet, but this suggests that we need to look further into um, the acti growth activity itself and not necessarily only the relative abundances of different life strategies. Uh, and then finally, we also try to classify what are the properties of R and K strategies, because if we figure out exactly how this works, this R and K selection um, influence on the, on the microbiome health, we of course want to know uh, how we can steer the community towards R or towards K 
uh, strategists and why they also seem to be co co existing very well in the reading water. So uh, you don't need to check all the details in this figure. I will just summarize the main findings. So we do find that there are significant differences between what's typically an R strategist and what is typically a K strategist. And what we see is that an R strategist, it has more metabolic pathways, but interestingly, they were not necessarily different from the ones that the K strategists had. Also, uh, the R strategists, they have more genes that are involved in chemotaxis and motility. So they are more uh, the motile bacteria, while K strategists are uh, more the sessile bacteria. They are also, uh, they have more, relatively more of their genome is um, invested in genes that are uh, needed for adhesion. Also uh, more um, genes for translational regulation for quorum sensing, so for communication, and a higher GC content. And a high GC content uh, actually relates to bacteria that reside well in high nutrient abundances. So altogether, these um, properties actually suggest that our strategists probably are really good at exploiting nutrient hotspots. And this relates to a hypothesis that has been uh, proposed already quite some time in uh, scientific literature by one of our uh, professors from our research group that our strategists will colonize particles in an environment where there's a high abundance of nutrients and that cage strategists will just be distributed quite homogeneously in the water because they uh, are not moving towards nutrient hotspots. And this would explain why you cannot make a completely K-dominated system, but you will always have R and K strategists in your system and that uh, the theory of R and K selection, which influences health, might need to be revised a little bit uh, to take into account that we can never have a system that uh, doesn't contain any R strategists. So uh, this brings me to my final slide. So I will just repeat the main conclusions of our sampling campaign that we performed. So it seemed like the phytoplankton was a very important steering factor for the rearing water microbiomes because we had these two very big community shifts related to the abundance of algae in the water. Our peripheral microbiomes were uh, characterized by very high variability, both within and between the batches. And they had a very large contribution to the rearing water, especially our two live feeds, the artemia and the algae. So together, these two points indicate that we really need to invest a lot of um, time and energy in management of these peripheral microbiomes as well. Uh, then uh, fourthly, the growth activity of bacteria in the water links better to the cultivation performance as compared to the abundance of the taxa in the water. And finally, we found evidence that there will be a niche separation between R and K strategists residing in the water. And that could be an explanation why they coexist together. So this was the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin. Very interesting uh, findings from your end. Uh, so now we can again open the Q&A session. Uh, there's one question already from, uh, I think this is after Ruben's session. So we can address that one while waiting for the questions from the others. Um, how, how long is it to run and have the data of one Kaito sample? Um, maybe Ruben, would you like to address this one? Yeah, yeah sure. But, uh, I uh, I messaged the, the the person who asked it uh, as well, but it's very quick. So th the limitation that we have is not necessarily in the sample analysis. So that's minutes uh, for analyzing the samples and then analyzing the data in the cloud and then reporting everything. Uh, the bottleneck is uh, is uh, logistic, uh, usually of getting the sample to the platform. Um, but we have solutions for this as well, so to minimize this. So this will be something that we introduce in the future on how to minimize this logistic journey uh, even more. Okay. Okay, thank you, um, Ruben. So we can have more questions from the audience. Um, you can raise, again, you can raise your hand virtually uh, so that you can ask our speakers here. Yes, uh, we have Dao. Please, Dao. Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. I, 
I just want to connect the, the information that just me uh, raise up. Um, so before we have the map link, a uh, different phase in Keto's technique uh, from Ruben data, and then uh, he showed the information about diver biocity of uh, microbiomes, um, help to predict the status of water in size. And then Jasmine, she wants to get the further analyzing to see how we can understand about uh, um, like activity or behavior of uh, microbiomes uh, so we can treat the water in the right way. Is it right? Uh, yes, that is indeed correct. So Kitos is making a lot of metrics to uh, quantify the current status of uh, your your aquaculture microbiome. And then, of course, if you want to develop management strategies on the long run, we need to know how to interpret those kind of metrics and make them into actions that can drive the community towards uh, healthy states. But to know how we can drive those communities, we need to understand the ecology. So that's a bit what I have been doing uh, during my PhD. So yeah. they're indeed very closely related. Yeah, cool. So uh, my question is, are you using the uh, genetic data for your analyzing? Is it right? Uh, you mean whether we use 16S for analyzing data in Kitos or? Uh, yeah, you, I, I think you use metagen uh, metagenome. So it's mean that, uh, something like sequencing. Uh, yeah, so the, the uh, 16S and the metagenomic sequencing, we indeed use to understand uh, the ecology, but then uh, I think for, but maybe Ruben can answer that question better, to then really make technology available to the farmer. The idea is that there you would then use um, more simple uh, technologies and and the metrics that they have developed, but they are based, of course, on knowledge that we gain over time using those more uh, complex methodologies like metagenomic sequencing. Okay, cool. So uh, with the information, uh, like with the, the, the genome data, uh, how uh, different in uh, biodiversity, like taxonomy uh, terms, how different between the way you do in genome and uh, and the one Rubin do in 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 front of the for, for the first batch uh, batch uh, presentation, the difference between the list of data base we have between different methods, and uh, do do we have any link or connect to solve the problem together or not? Uh, yes, this is something that we actually work on very actively. So to uh, make these, uh, well, to infer with those more simple technologies like flow cytometry, which bacterial taxa are present, we really make a combination of both technologies and we use machine learning models to really try to link uh, both data to each other so that we can use the more easy measurements but do get information that we should normally get from, for example, sequencing. So in the development phase, there's a very uh, strong connection between the two types of data. Okay, so I, I think that uh, the one you do is not included in the service of Kitos, is this right? It's a, a different research. But we, we do it, but not as a, as, a, as a service for us. This is a means of building our models so we can get the best predictions. Uh, the simple reason for this is that these are very laborious, time-intensive methods that require a lot of careful scientific attention. Uh, so it's not something that you can easily do uh, in, in a month or half a year uh, sometimes. Uh, so this is something I think, Yasmin, you can uh, testify to this. This has been work in progress for over two and a half years mm -hmm. of collecting all that data, uh, interpreting all the data. And now that we have uh, that information, what we are doing is we're using that information to build machine learning models that can predict uh, farming relevant information based on our single cell platform. And so we don't need that very complex genomic information anymore, um, other than retraining and improving our models. That's our philosophy because with our single cell platform, we can go really quickly uh, in, in giving results and answers to farmers uh, to take action. Well, we cannot do it if we just rely on uh, genomic methods.
Yep. Uh, and my last question is for Jasmine. That um, I I thinking about the environmental DNA. So something related to your direction in the future. Uh, sorry, you mean detecting environmental DNA? Yeah. Uh, the, do you think about the apply of environmental DNA stuff or something like that to your research uh, in the future? Uh, this is actually something that I haven't uh, thought about including yet. Uh, like um, very simple, uh, like we take a little bit of uh, water from the pond or something, and we try to find out uh, the taxas of the microbiomes in the water, and we have that method like environmental DNA. Um, so it's something like uh, the result, we, we can do, we can use the result for that to apply for your analyzing or not. Yes, so you, just, so you could use it, I think, Yasmin, as an input to make our prediction models better. But I personally am quite cautious on eDNA because it measures all the extracellular DNA that's there. And so you have a lot of dead microbes and free our DNA present in an aquatic system uh, that's not attached to a cell. So it's not active. It's not part of an organism and you will pick that up. And so efforts that I've seen in, in other applications in ocean studies where you use eDNA, it's that it's picking up things that are no longer alive and no longer there. So I mm -hmm. think with eDNA, you have to be really careful in interpreting it. Uh, because I have now seen examples in, in other sectors where they, no matter what they try to do with disinfection, sanitization, deep clean, they always detect with eDNA the organisms that they don't want to be there, the opportunistic pathogens. And yeah. so it's, um, you need to be very cautious, I think, with the methodology. Uh, that being said, it's something that we haven't explored yet ourselves. Uh, we have just experienced this from you know, somewhat of a, you know, a, a tangent uh, with, with some research that we've seen. Uh, but those are uh, feedbacks that we have gotten from the industry that uh, they have to be really cautious in interpreting the data. Yeah, appreciate your answer. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Now we have uh, also participant who would like to ask Jasmine. Please, Fernando. Uh, hello, Jasmine. I'm just wondering how long does it take to run for you to run or to assemble all of the MAT for your microbiome? Uh, uh, well, so we had 16 samples from our rearing water uh, communities, and I think, uh, well, it was a bit scattered because we were working on other projects at the same time. But if you combine everything, it easily takes you half a year, I think. I think that's a minimal estimate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fernando. Any other questions from the participants? Oh, I'm looking at the chat box. Okay, while waiting for the others, uh, I do have one question from, from Yasmin, uh, for Yasmin. Um, from the slide where you, sh where you showed us the microbiome of an Artemia storage tank, uh, you, you showed us the, the graphs of this relative abundance graphs. Um, uh, I was not, I'm not sure whether I got it right, but uh, I think there was only a graph there, there were graphs from for from only one time point. Is that correct, or did I understood it differently? Yes, that's indeed correct. Uh, I didn't mention it, but we sampled each uh, batch for all of our live and dry feeds only in the morning. So that means that the time point that we had for sequencing was always on that growth curve, the last time point. So we don't actually know who was uh, growing, for example, in those Artemia storage tanks because we only have the last time point. We never have the time points before. Um, but so that would last, be very interesting, yeah. The last time point was at 8, 8 a.m. in the morning. Yes, that's correct. Where we, have, where we already have 10 times growth yes. of bacteria. Oh, okay, very interesting. 
Uh, and also for, for the microbiome from the algae culture, uh, what type of algae did you analyze? What was it uh, from, from a green algae or a brown algae or any specific uh, algae? It was a uh, high to cerros. Supposedly a pure culture, more or less, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to invite maybe the other audience want to ask our speakers today or still digesting. <laughs> Uh, okay, no raised hand at the moment. Oh uh, yeah, do you still have one more questions? Uh, okay. Again, sorry, um, uh, I have questions because um, when we talking about uh, like vibrio uh, bacteria, some of them um, like they have the gene that can make the toxics like the spread to the stream, some not. So with the system S, uh, how can we identify if we have that uh, we will in the pond, but uh, how can we identify that they ham or harmful or not? Yep. Uh, so actually with the 16S, it's not possible to get functional information on your taxa. So you cannot uh, identify whether or not uh, that toxin was present if you only have 16S uh, sequencing. But of course, you can use metagenomics for that. But even then, um, it depends a little bit on what you are looking for. Because for example, uh, EMS, those toxin genes, they are present on a plasmid. And if you then uh, create your metagenomes, you often don't have that plasmid in the genome of, uh, of the VPO necessarily, because the yeah, sequence-wise, it will not match uh, very well. So it's not that easy to really link that plasmid then to, to that uh, toxin. So it depends a little bit on what kind of toxin genes you are uh, looking for. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in that kind of functional uh, information, you really need to move away from 16S to more complex technologies like metagenomics. Yeah, and, and, and maybe to add out that, related to what I, I messaged you said with the Vibrio marker that we've developed, which connects uh, now 16S data with our single cell platform. Uh, the advantage is that with our single cell platform, we do look at functional and phenotypic properties, such as you say, whether they can swim or mobile or not, that's information that we capture. Uh, so we're seeing if we can in the future actually specify whether there's a risk for specific Vibrio morphologies or phenotypes that ha are virulent in the system rather than just detecting them as a group as a whole. So by connecting genetic and phenotypic information, I think you have best of both worlds uh, because as you rightly say, uh, Vibrio only become virulent when they change morphologically and phenotypically. So you need to capture that aspect as well. Oh, cool. Yeah, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, again, Dao. Mm, yeah, since we are actually already ran out of time uh, for today. Uh, yes, so to end our event for today, I'd like to have uh, a very brief photo group session. If anybody would like to open their camera so that we can have a nice picture, but uh, yeah, for everyone who is available um, so that we can quickly get a, a picture together. Uh, our assistant Rista can help us with this. Can you please give the instruction? <laughs> okay. So please everyone, if you are available, uh, join us and open your camera so that we can have our picture um, before we end our session for today. Okay, if everyone is ready. Uh, there's two page. Uh, I think so. I will, yeah, uh, I will take the first page. Uh, please give your best pose. One, two, three. Okay. Let me take a second. Okay. 
Okay, then I will take the second page. One, two, three. All done. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rista. Um, I would like to also invite Prof. Gede Swantika if you have any closing remark, uh, Professor Gede. Please, thank you. You're still on mute, but. Okay. Uh... Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to Ruben and Jasmine. I would like to say uh, thank you very much uh, to both of you for your uh, inspiring sharing for mostly for the students. Okay, uh, as a practitioner in aquaculture, I think uh, your presentation will will support this this uh, the industry in particular for shrimp farming in uh, under the frame of uh, sustainable. Uh, operations, uh, Ruben and, and Jasmine. I think the approach of microbiological uh, thing is, is very important because based on my experience also, uh, the, the key success story of this uh, animal cultivation in aquaculture is uh, in, on how to, uh, on, the, on the ability, uh, on how to manage uh, our microbial community during the whole culture periods. So based on this, uh, uh, presentation, I think we realize uh, that uh, it's very important to have uh, early warning or early monitoring of the, the microbial community. And also we try to keep maintaining the, the expected microbial community during the, the culture period in order to have a successful uh, aquaculture production. I know that this one is very dynamic journey. Uh, it's very dynamic. So you need the very tight control regarding uh, the the the, the the balance of your bacterial community. And then also, uh, I do agree with you regarding the, the tropic the status of our culture. I, I do, and then uh, uh, regarding the balance be between heterotroph and, uh, and uh, photoautotroph one, that one also the key. And then uh, once uh, conclusion coming from Jasmine also, I do agree regarding the role of phytoplankton in steering uh, our microbiome community because in our group at ITB also we had uh, one experience working with Cytoceros together with Dr. Lenny and then we can realize that with, if we can keep the balance of this phytoplankton in particular the use of, of diatom Cytoceros gracilis in our culture and that uh, uh, at the same time we can control uh, more stable uh, bacterial community not only for the, the pathogenic one but uh, heterotrophic bacteria in general. Okay, again, thank you very much, uh, Ibu Leni, for this uh, event. Thank you very much for all participants. And then again, 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 thank you very much, Ruben and Jasmine, uh, for your contribution and hoping to have a very uh, tight uh, collaboration uh, among us for the, uh, uh, not uh, in the near future, because we are going to have uh, a project together with Dr. Leni also regarding the monitoring of uh, microbiomes uh, community in uh, one of shrimp culture operation in Bali. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all of you. Buleni, please. Uh. Yes, thank you, uh, Prof. Gede, for the closing remark. So with that, we will end our guest lecture event for today. I would like also to again uh, thank our speakers today, Dr. Ruben, and also Jasmine, for Yasmin, I wish you lots of success in finalizing your PhD and for the, all the participants for joining us uh, today. And please uh, fill in the attendance link, uh, attendance form using the following link. And uh, I would like also to inform uh, our next events next week. Uh, we will have another two guest lectures from uh, Professor Dr. Peter Bossier again from Hanji University Belgium. So you are all invited to register and also join us again next week. So with that, thank you very much everyone. Uh, and I wish you all uh, good health and take care everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank thank you, you very much everyone. everyone. Very much. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye. -bye.